Hello and welcome to Jump To It for irishracing.com. My name's Joe Ryan. I'll be your host for today's show where we've got plenty to talk about after a fascinating November meeting at Cheltenham, as well as looking ahead to some big races this weekend. Now, we've got some tips along the way as well from our expert guests. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce the team that we're going to be talking to today. So Vincent Finnegan and Ed Quigley, of course. Vincent, you are away in sunny Spain at the moment. So it's good to see that you've been working on your tan. But how are you getting on in terms of the racing? And how much have you been able to see while you've been away? Well, I haven't seen a whole lot. I've seen bits and pieces on Twitter. That's about it. Yeah. Some of the highlights on there. Um, haven't seen a whole lot of racing, but at the same time, we're keeping up in touch with the results and the form. So hopefully we can have a few winners this weekend. And for you, Ed, you were there at the November meeting as well. We touched on that already uh, at Cheltenham. How was it for you as an experience, of course, being amongst the crowd yet again? Yeah, great meeting. Uh, it really ramps up a bit, doesn't it? The November meeting of it, both days, the October meeting, quite quiet, quite so. So, yeah, there was 34,000 there for the Saturday uh, this year, which is uh, touching upon a record for the meeting. You know, everyone desperate to get there. Uh, it was packed, a wonderful atmosphere, some spectacular racing. Uh, it, it really was a really good meeting. It was almost felt like uh, racing was back in inverted commas. Uh, yeah, really thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyable three days. Now, of course, last week we did big up the uh, My Drogo effort against Gin Online, and that was probably the most dramatic moment of the weekend last week. So, Ed, just talk us through that. You were there on course, able to see the incident, what happened. Rachel Blackmore, of course, got in a bit of a trouble with the stewards afterwards as well. But just take us through it and what you saw. Yeah, absolutely. I actually walked down onto the rails by the finish line to watch this. And uh, as my Drogo came into the home straight, turned into the home straight on the bridle, I thought, well, it's just a formality. Pings this and then uh, probably jumps two or three clear, jumps the last. I mean, I was very impressed with my Drogo's jumping and travelling. He was slightly long at the, uh, the the ditch down the back. But other than that, he looked a uh, real natural. Yeah, they turned into the home straight, came to... Um, Came to the fence where it was absolute carnage to out, wasn't there? So in, in real time, I thought my Drogo had fallen and brought down Gin Online. But you see it from head on. My Drogo has actually jumped the fence perfectly. Uh, and he's just slipped and knuckled on, on landing, really. His feet have just given way under the turf as he's jumped the fence. Totally independent to Gin Online. Uh, that mare, Henry de Bromhead's mare, both her feet have gone through the top of the fence. And she's fallen independently. Uh, of course, Harry Scout has gone out the side door. Uh, Rachel Blackmore uh, uh, obviously has done uh, heroics. Uh, there was an absolute, probably the biggest roar of the day from the crowd was Rachel Blackmore staying on board, gin on lime, and then going on to win. Obviously, yeah, a lot of controversy in the aftermath. And uh, I got a bit. I at being watching the race live on the course, I did not notice anything wrong. I did not sense there was anything wrong. To me, there didn't appear like there was something that should be looked into. So only when I go into the uh, the echo chamber that is social media afterwards, there's an absolute storm going on about whether she should have dismounted and checked the horse. And da, 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 da. Look, I mean, the, the rules are there in place. At, as things stand, she was permitted to carry on racing. Now, she's been given a kind of a slap on the wrist if you like saying well you perhaps should have looked after the horse more but you can't kind of say well here's the rule uh oh but by the way you, you know you know don't abide by it so i'm saying I, I just think it all a little bit too much about nothing um i know people harp on to the days i believe when ruby walsh uh dis, uh remounted corto star didn't he about 15 years ago this is in the days when you could do that and um it turned out corto star uh suffered a, a tendon injury and of course, but you're not to know at the time, are you? And I thought, on oh, balance, you've got to trust the, you know, the 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 jockey ship uh, of Rachel Blackmore. Uh, if she felt there was something seriously wrong at the time, no doubt she would have done what was in best interest for the horse. But look, you're in a two runner race. Your, your other horse has departed. She's still intact. The partnership's still intact. And under the rules, as they are, she's permitted to carry on racing. So I just think it's all a lot of hot air about nothing, really. I, I, I thought it was a brat. Instead of people moaning about it, I just thought, my, how brilliant it was she stayed on. The horse doing, you know, above 30 mile an hour, crashes through a fence. She stayed in place and, and got the job done. Uh, I just think it was it was good to watch. It was brilliant. It was exciting and, um, and well done. Yeah, and now, of course, the big race of the weekend as well was the Paddy Power Gold Cup. So, Ed, just take us through that, your quick assessment of that race and uh, what you made of the final, uh, the front three. Yeah, to try and summarise as quick as I can. I mean, it was run at a searing gallop. Uh, I think jockey Tom Cannon, who rode um, Dan the Kayak, who finished 
uh, down the field said it felt like they were going in a two mile championship pace. Uh, it really was run it searing gallop. There were horses thrown in the towel from long way out. As a consequence, not a lot really got into it from off the pace uh, set by uh, Paint the Dream. And there was, of course, Midnight Shadow up there. And it, it was running at yeah, a furious gallop. Midnight Shadow, lovable eight year old for the Sue Smith team. Uh, eventually got his kind of moment in the sun at Cheltenham. Uh, that was worth touch upon the ground there. It was unusually quick for the November meeting. They had to water the course just to take the sting out of it earlier in the week. And he bound, bounced up the hill and, and thrived on it. Uh, all, all credit to Connections. They're going to really tilt at windmills next because he goes to the King George at Kempton on December the 26th. Look, it'd be a 66 to one shot there. But they said, look, we're not, we're no shrinking violets. We'll go out toe to toe with Frodo on. Uh, and we'll go and have some fun. I thought all credit to Connection. So, yeah, brilliant winner there. And of the, the second and the third, uh, uh, of course, you've got Protectorat for Dan Skelton, who absolutely stormed up the hill, uh, looked out pace, flew up the hill at the running. Um, qu- quotes in the aftermath is, they need three miles. Are we going to go to the many clouds chase uh, at Aintree in a fortnight's time? Or they're considering um, a, a race which would interest Vincent uh, coming to the Savills chase. Uh, uh, in Ireland, uh, uh, he's an unexposed type. Who, as I said, he's in the rated in mid one fifties. But I think there could be a lot more to come over three miles from him. Anyway, so he's one to keep your eyes on with staying trips in mind. And the third was Layla for Paul Nichols, who was well backed. Uh, he was twenties into around five to one, wasn't he? In the build up to that contest, he'd had his wind operation. Left Kayleigh would have got, gone to Paul Nichols, ran a storm uh, finishing third. Uh, Harry Cobden said, "Yeah, just a little bit rusty." Uh, but uh, he came up the hill. The horse is back, if you like, after two pulled up efforts. He will go to the Caspian Caviar Gold Cup, uh, the, the Paddy Power Gold Cup take two, uh, for want of a better phrase, at Cheltenham's meeting next month, on, which, of course, is on the new course. A bit more stamina there. So that, that's the kind of fallout for the big three. But, yeah, well done to win a midnight shadow. And connections are going to roll the dice uh, in the King George. Why not? And, and for you, Ed, as well, just speaking about maybe aside from the obvious horses that perform well at the November meeting, you've got a few eye catches as well, maybe some outsiders for us to look for in the future. Well, I just wanted to flag up three, um, not necessarily uh, dark horses, but ones that uh, I, I still think represent fair value with the like the Child of Festival in mind. That was the kind of angle I wanted to come through because, after all, a lot of the, the course of distance form, a lot of the graded form we see here, you go back to the history in the November meeting, it has a pretty good record of throwing up festival winners. And yeah, so three, I very quickly want to pick out Sporting John, who uh, returned back over hurdles um, after, he, he never convinced us a chase. He won the Silly Isles in, in, in almost a fluke when everything else either fell or pulled up um, at grade one level back at Sandown in February. Uh, and then, yeah, he, 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 I think he fell behind Monkfish, didn't he? And unseated at Aintree. Look, he's not a natural chaser. Back over hurdles, he was in the handicap company off 146, but he jumped to travel beautifully. He ran with all his old zest. Let's not forget, he was sent off second favourite to beat Envoy Allen in the Ballymore a couple of years ago. And uh, uh, yeah, I spoke to Barry Garrett about him. He said, yeah, for whatever reason, he ran flat that day, but then get his spark back. He's a horse with serious gears. And he won nicely. AP McCoy was... Um, doing a few of the kind of media rounds afterwards sit next to JP McManus. And he's kind of suggested that I have a think about the Stayers hurdle now and like the Cleve hurdle would look a natural target for him uh, coming back there in January. He's 25 to one for the Stayers hurdle um, without trying to digress too much, but the, you know, the likes of time Hill has already come back this season, run deplorably. Florian Port has already hit the deck. There were a few others. You look at the protagonist in the anti-post market with the Stayers hurdle is it's muddy water, shall we say? So sporty job for the Stayers hurdle, I think represent the value of 25 to one. Uh, Blazing Cat, for Charles Burns, really powered up the hill to win the uh, the, the Grade Two Ballymore race. There, I really liked the way in which he was. The fact he didn't jump all that well, uh, I think there's a lot. You know, you, you there's a lot of brushing up to do in that department, and yet he still won with plenty in hand. He's got serious engine. Uh, it sounds like. Yeah, Albert Bartlett's the long-term aim for this galloper. I mean, he's, he looks like a big old-fashioned chaser, but I expect him to end up um, over three miles at the Cheltenham Festival in a few months' time. He's around 20 to 1 to win that. I think that still looks fair. Uh, and then thirdly, a horse who fell uh, in the three-mile novice chase on the Sunday, Oscar Elite uh, for the Colin Tizar team. I am convinced this horse had got round. Uh, he, he fell three out. He got round. I'm not sure they would have seen which way he went personally. He was jumping really nicely for a horse on chase debut and uh, just tipped up and made an error. Look, uh, I wouldn't be kind of drawing stumps of him. He's 33 to 1 for what was the RSA chase. Uh, of course, the Irish probably hold a strong hand in it. But um, if you remember last season, a lot of the Colin Tizard horses were running deplorably, yet he was the one horse 
who actually managed to kind of show some goods, didn't he? He was runner-up in the Albert Bartlett, which was good performance. And then he was third behind Brave Man's game and a voice in your entry. So he, uh, yeah, he fell, uh, but I would not be discouraged at all. He looked an absolute natural over large obstacles, a bit of cut in the ground. Then I'm sure they get him out again in the three-mile contest. Yeah, Oscar Elite uh, for the uh, Team Tizard, definitely one who I think will be winning quite a few races over fences this season. And also a big shout out for you, Ed, as well. We're picking out Sporting John as your tip from last week. We'll get to those later on in the show. Now, one topic I want to raise as well is uh, Philip Rothwell. He's had a bit of a roller coaster week. We talked about Rachel Blackmore perhaps trying too hard on Gen Online, but Philip Rothwell being accused of non-triers. Vincent, take us through this story and uh, what it means for him and how he's getting on at the moment. Well, it's, it's just an interesting few days for Philip because he went over to Cheltenham on Friday and um, had a big price winner three to one shot Mac Alpine won for him and I'm sure most people would have seen the post-race interview and um, he did with Lydia Hislop where he was um, very emotional to say the least after the win it was 15 years since he had a win at the Cheltenham Festival this obviously wasn't the Cheltenham Festival someone probably forgot to tell Philip uh, that it was only the Friday the November meeting but at the same time look it was a big it was a big thing for him he's having a very good season in Ireland his best ever he's had a lot of winners this season but then he went to Limerick on Tuesday and was uh, in a bit of hot water with one of his runners, a horse called Duffy's Holy, a 28 to 1 outsider and a handicap hurdle. Um, standard stuff, I suppose, with the Stewarts, particularly around this time of the year, as the horses are coming back uh, for their first runs of the season, most of them, that they keep an eye on the back markers to see what's happening and the ones that, that aren't trying as hard as some of the others. So, what ended up happening here was he got brought in, uh, Philip was fined £2,000 for basically for not trying. Adam Short, the jockey, got 10 days and the horse can't run for 60 days. To be fair to Philip, he got a bit upset over it. Again, not, not as emotional as he was in Cheltenham, but he, he, wasn't, he wasn't too happy with the stewards. And you can see reasons why he'd be right here in the sense it didn't look that bad a case. The horse lost his shoe in running. He also jumped left at a number of hurdles, particularly the last, which you can see in the reruns. Um, so he wasn't too happy about it. But the other thing is, you can't really blame the stewards here. This is the second time they looked at this horse. They looked at him in May when he ran with an inexperienced rider on him. And again, uh, they were the same thing, coming from the back, running on late, and they felt that he didn't try that day. Philip Rothwell, what he did on that occasion, he didn't get fined at all because he blamed the jockey. <laughs> he said the jockey um, made a bit of a mess of it and it didn't look good and he agreed it wasn't a good ride. So the jockey got suspended. The horse got done for 42 days that time, so he isn't really back that long. So you can see why the eyes would have been on him. I'm not quite sure why they'd use the exact same tactics again. And also that Adam Short, who hadn't ridden the horse before, was told not to hit him with the whip. You're only looking for trouble, realistically, in this day and age, with, with so much scrutiny on these non-triers. That The thing that comes back to me about these is they always seem to be horses that are ridden from the rear and stay on in the closing stages. How many non-triers are there ridden the other way around where they go off too quick in front um, and then just drop out? They're never, ever brought in for this. It's mm. the only ones that we ever see or ever hear about are the ones that you sit out the back and you run on late. So I can see why Philip was a bit annoyed about the, the thing on Tuesday, but it just shows that the trials and tribulations of being a trainer these days, that you're, one moment you're on a high and the next minute you're right rock bottom again. So interesting few days for Philip Rothwell. Well, speaking of uh, potential trials as well, you've also got a bit of an update on the drug raid story coming out of Ireland as well, Vincent. So you did write an interesting blog post about it on Irish Racing, but have you got a further angle and a further take on that breaking story? Well, the, the big issue, there's no point breaking over all ground here. Everyone listening to this or watching this program no doubt knows as much as we do at this stage around what happened at Monaster Evan Tuesday of last week. But the basic thing here is that this is very difficult for racing in general. It's over a year, it was September 2020, Jim Bojack went public about saying that he thought there was major issues in Irish horse racing, um, basically with steroids. So we're now uh, over a year into that. There's been all this innuendo and talk and whispers about this, that and the other. And everyone's saying it's, it's so and so or it's not or there's nothing here or yes, there is. And no one really knows. So the first piece of absolutely hard evidence we seem to have is that there was a raid last week in Monaster Evan. But the more you read into the bare facts we have on it, admittedly, we don't know what, what drugs are involved particularly. And according to um, the culprit in this, uh, um, a guy called John Warwick, who's been around for many years in the game, visiting Ireland for over 30 years by his own admission, treating horses with tendon injuries. 
that he's saying he didn't have any steroids. It was other remedies and medicines and concoctions or whatever he used. The issue with it is that because of that, everything's back in the spotlight. There were trainers there on uh, found at the premises with their horses and everything else, which most people will know. But there was two in particular that we that we know were there. One was Liam Burke, and the other is Ted Walsh. And um, so high profile enough with Ted Walsh, and lots of other people seem to have been associated with this guy down the years. But most of them are saying it was just for tendon injuries, and he did a la laser work on them. They didn't think there was any medication particularly involved in this at all. So the problem is it could take up to another two years to find out what medications were, the, were, were confiscated by the Department of Agriculture and police on the day. We can't do another two years of this, realistically. Like, this is a disaster. And then you have other stuff coming out from uh, other newspaper investigative journalists in both the Irish Independent newspaper and the Sunday Times who are saying that the tip-off that the Department of Agriculture got Firstly, it was to do with there was a um, a private investigator hired. We're still not 100% sure who hired him. According to the Irish Independent piece, it says an individual, whoever that was, presumably another trainer, whether that was Irish or English, we don't know. The Sunday Times article hints that it was a group of English trainers who hired this. Then there's also was, um, some talk around it that it's coming from the US, it's, it's FBI intelligence. This is madness, in fairness. And like, why now? That's the bottom line, isn't it? Why now? Why all of this all of a sudden? It's it's as if we're like it's it's kind of McCarthyism from the 1940s and 50s in America, where everyone was a communist. It's almost like that in Ireland now at this stage when it's coming. You can you can say anyone's a communist here, or you can say anyone is taking drugs, and there's no way they can disprove it. And that's becoming the issue here. So until we find out what exactly was found in Monaster Evan, this is a mess. I'll just be another two year mess. I was yes. just going to say, Vince, yeah, I mean, for you know, a lot of these things, when there's often a misdemeanor or there's wrongdoing, things unravel pretty quickly, don't they? Normally, in most walks of life, yeah. It's what, well, as you say, it's over a year since Jim Bolger alluded to Lance Armstrong. You've got trades like Noel Mead, who was interviewed on uh, Luck on Sunday the other day, saying, you know, not very happy, shall we say, with Mr. Bolger's comments, saying he thinks it's all being overblown. Where's he getting all this from, or for words to that effect? And you're starting to wonder either, you know, you've got some uh, absolute world-class operators in, in the act of deception here, or it is just absolute, there's nothing going on, and it's just smoke and mirrors. I mean, everything, everything I keep reading about this case is he says, she says, and we think, and the spies up in trees, and, you know, it's like an episode of Homeland, uh, yet where's the empirical evidence? And I'm starting to think, well, if you haven't found any after a year... Like, at what, what point are you are you ever going to find any? As I said, either there's a, an incredibly uh, eloquent cover-up job going on here, or is this, as you say, is, is it just a load of hot air that's got out there and perhaps uh, Mr. Bolger's, uh, by mistake, um, thought there was something when there isn't? I mean, it just, it just almost just seems... I mean, what, what, if, you, if you can't find anything after a year, then what is it you're looking for and when are you going to find it would be more possible. Well, look, look from, from my point of view, I, I'm totally impartial to this i really don't care if there's if there's drugs there take them out show us them and ban whoever it is and we'll start again and move on from it. it's not going to it's not going to personally bother me either way whether they're involved or not but the bottom line is we're being made believe that ireland currently is like east germany was back in the 70s and 80s with their athletes and everything that it's all oh, everyone's at this it's all drugs and that's why they're winning everything in cheltenham and everything else to me that's not true the reason I say that is, you, you go back to East Germany, if you were a journalist in East Germany, you think you would have been allowed into all the training camps? I can go to any yard in Ireland. I can ring up mm -hmm. any of those trainers. I've been in Ballydoyle numerous times. I've been in Willie Mullins. There's all the other yards around the place, Dermot Wells, everywhere else. There's no problem going to these yards. You make an appointment, you go in, you can see all the horses. They'll bring them all out, show you them work, do everything. If they were really doping all of these horses at such a high level, we're being told, surely to God they wouldn't let anybody, anybody near the place. But that's not the case. So I, I'm not quite sure. I really don't think it's true. I'm sure there are people, there are people, I could probably name you people if the truth was known, who may have dabbled with steroids down the years or been trying this trick and that trick. They try every trick in the book to get a winner, some of the small guys. But at the same time, at, we're, we're led to believe it's Lance Armstrong level. I really don't think it's that level within our myself. Another thing is you look at the two trainers that were found in... Um, when the drug raid happened, they, they appeared there during that time while the police and the Department of Agriculture were there. One of them is Ted Walsh. He's got a 7% strike rate this year. 
Like, if he was really using steroids, would he have a 7% strike rate? The other guy who turned up was Liam Burke. One winner from 80 runners this year. Come on. Like, no. Let's be honest here. The, the, these guys are not are not the, the super criminals that they're being led to believe, or we've been led to believe, is, is around this whole thing. I think this is a mistake. The, um, that people are, the mistake is people are linking the Jim Bulger steroid issue, Lance Armstrong level, to what happened in Monastery Evan. I don't think they're linked. That's where I am at this stage. Now, I'm, I'm, will, I'm willing to be uh, convinced of other things should steroids be found or whatever, but I really can't see it at this stage. Of course, for the latest news, always check out irishracing.com for articles on this developing story as we get the information. But now we're going to move on to the upcoming races. There's a fantastic card, both for Ascot, Haydock, and also Garwin Park we're going to look at, and Navin as well. So let's take in some of the upcoming races for this weekend. Now, the first race we're going to look at is actually the early start at Garran Park. We've got the uh, Irish Stallion Farms EBF Beginners Steeplechase. And one horse that stands out here is the former Ballymore winner, Bob Ollinger. So, Ed, take us through what do you make of this entry, him going chasing, and uh, yeah, what do you make of his chances? Well, obviously, he was the, the standout performer, wasn't he? One of the most exciting winners of the Chantler Festival last season. Now, swatted aside. Uh, brave man's game, didn't he? I mean, it was interesting listening to Harry Cobden said, you know, he, he's ridden some pretty top races, uh, hurdle races. Uh, he thought he was going a fair old lick on brave man's game as he turned into home straight. And he said, um, Bob Ollinger went past him like he was statuesque. Uh, yeah, he looks the part, doesn't he? Bob Ollinger, really excited about seeing him over fences. Uh, he missed last week's engagement uh, with a stone bruise. Uh, be running here. Uh, I mean, if you were going to be totally pedantic facetious you say a lot of his form pretty much all his form last season came on softer heavy ground we've had an unusually dry spell if you like so it's a slight unknown i think the ground was officially uh, yielding at the moment but i think we're, we're clutching at straws there uh, i think he'll be really excited type he'll take a lot of beating credit to the rest of the field though they're not doing the usual uh, let's all just hide uh, and disappear mm. and end up with a three runner race we've got a nice field here what is it i'm um, just 18 runners going to post with some Useful types in here, aren't they? I think we've got the likes of Bacardi's, who was no mug and was placed in a stayers hurdle, and Ashdale Bob and uh, a couple of others, Column of Fire and stuff. So uh, it's uh, it'll be a decent enough test on Chase Day. We'll have to be on his metal, but really looking forward to seeing him. Of course, they've got to jump the fences, but yeah, naturally would be a shock if he was beaten. And Vincent, do you see any challenges here for Bob Ollinger or do you think it should just be a pretty straightforward run for him? Oh, this this is a good race. There's um, there's some solid depth in this. We have six previous point to point winners, including Bob Ollinger. You have six horses in it rated 140 plus over hurdles going chasing. This is a good level. This race was won last year, I think, um, the last two years. Energamine and Lorena won this. This this is a high class contest. What's amazing is you have you have 18 runners. Lots of them with chances. Obviously, Bob Bob Ollinger will be a short price to um to show how good he really is here. And he is a previous point-to-point winner. He won his point-to-point, I think, by 15 lengths in Tattersall. So everything says he'll win, but this is a this is a high-class contest. The value of the race is 15,500 euro. You've got Brave Man's Game, who was beaten 12 lengths in Cheltenham by Bob Ollinger. He runs in a 50,000 pound race um, in, on Haydock, is it on Saturday? Mm. And there's only three, three rivals to him. It's hard to believe that the different levels here. I know we've had a lot of there was a lot of talk about the my Drogo race last week as well with two runners. And um, there's definitely an issue in the UK with whatever about in Ireland that horses avoid each other to Cheltenham, but certainly in the UK, maybe there's too many opportunities for these horses. To be so, totally agree. Yeah. yeah. I think, yeah, we have covered that at length on Jump to It, and I think it will just be a yeah. recurring theme until it becomes a bit more settled, perhaps more like the Irish. Um, but let's move on to Ascot and the 205 and a really interesting race here as well. Uh, we've got former uh, yeah, favourite for the champion chase, Deffy De Sol, up against Lost in Translation and also, of course, former winner master Tommy Tucker going into this one. Ed, take us through it. Uh, who do you think is the worthy favourite in this one and can you pick a winner? Well, your first question there is a very good one, actually, Joe, because um, looking at Yodge, you more or less got uh, seven to two co-favourites of four, haven't you? With Dashiell Drash, of course, loves this venue. Master Tommy Tucker, uh, Deffy Desoy and Lost in Translation. It's hard to call. It's, a, it's, a, it's almost a bit of a comeback trail for a lot of these, isn't it? A lot of these horses trying to recapture former glories. I mean, 
one of the horse in here who does stand out is Lost in Translation. Who's, I mean, he's, well, he's 92 in a few places, uh, given that the Tizar team are back in form. I mean, crikey, this horse led a gold cup with 100 yards mm. to go. He went up to Haydock. He swatted aside Bristol to my like and also ran in the final for that day. I know it's a lot of ifs and buts, but this is a horse who has previously raced a very high level of form. Um, you know, if you could get him back, he's had the wind operation, he's only nine, and the ground will be absolutely spot on for him. I mean, it's good to soft, uh, good in places with a dry spell over the next 24 hours or so. Based on a mixture of sentiment and just the fact he's got a lot of previous back class, he would be my tentative selection in here, given that, as I said, he's run some very, very good races in his time. Definitely the soy, uh, obviously under a bit of a cloud. Master Tommy Tucker had his spin at Weatherby over hurdles to get fit for this. And Dashiell Drasher, of course, going right-handed. Ascot, that's really playing to his ballpark. But again, I would just be a little bit nervous with the ground for him. Uh, I mean, this is his home territory, Ascot. But all his best form has come on very deep ground. Uh, again, we keep going on about it, but it's unusually dry at the moment. You're going to be looking at pretty much good ground by the time they go to post at Ascot on Saturday. So that would be my worry for him. So it's a, it's a cracking little contest, tentatively lost in translation, but uh, not really surprised if any of them win. And for you, Vincent, any kind of value angle going into this one? Or like Ed says, it's going to be pretty hard to, to pick the winner, isn't it? Well, the real thing here is just definitely the soy. Seeing the horse, had a wind operation, see how that works out. The trip is obviously a bit of an unknown as well. Um, Lost in translation, the horse I like, but Jakers, you've, you've really got to have a, um, if you've got to really wish that he, that he turns turns up at the best form. I, I can't see Lost in translation. It's, it's, it's too much of a leap of faith for me. Dashiell Drasher, everything says him bar the ground. That's the only issue with mm. the ground. But Dashiell Drasher is the one can he give six pounds to the likes of Defi Desai and Lost in Translation? It, this is a tricky race. This would be a no bet for me you now over the weekend. It's too, it's too hard to call at this stage. Okay, let's move on to the next race on the card at Ascot, the 240. We've got the Coral Hurdle, of course, Goshen going in for this one up against the favourite Buzz. Uh, so, Vincent, just take us through this one. Do you think Buzz is just going to be too strong for this field? Oh, I do. I did, this would be a confident bet for me you now for the weekend. Um, Cesarowicz winner, that was a very good Cesarowicz. The, the front two, him and Burning Victory pulled a long way clear in that. He's obviously fit enough from there. Some of these haven't had a run. Uh, there's only four runners as such in it, but you've, you've Goshen missed an engagement because of the ground was too quick the last day. Uh, I'd be taking on Goshen every day now. That's, mm. that's the key to it for me is um, wherever Goshen runs, you got to find something to beat it and you got to have a bet match because Goshen, he blows out more often than than he, than he does what we thought he was going to do mm -hmm. after um, his triumph hurdle in Cheltenham when he fell at the last when he looked like an absolute star. Um, I, I'd i be very keen on Buzz here. His, his form is pretty good now. He was second to Abracababras in the grade one in um, entry back in April as well. Solid form. There's song for um, someone won the race, I think it was last year. Last year that one it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, last year that one hasn't had a run either. I'd be willing to take all of them on with Buzz here. It's a slightly odds on now. It had been bigger prices during the week. It was as big as six to four when uh, the betting came, uh, went up for this race. But now we're down to four runners. It's a touch of odds on. It's still worth a bet. And Ed, do you share that view or do you see a, maybe a potential upset in this one? I think Buzz is the horse to beat. Personally, I think, again, I'm, I'm, a, I'm really a boring person. But um, going on about ground here, I mean, all Goshen's, his four hurdle wins for Gary Moore, five have come on soft, a mixture of soft and heavy ground. Uh, this is going to be lively enough. Perhaps uh, I suppose the step up in trip is in unknown angle with him. Uh, but I just think, yeah, Buzz would be spot on for this song. For someone won it last year, but it was an awful race. You had Lorena who was gone at the game and Call Me Lord who, uh, who didn't stay and was far too keen. And again, that was on very tested ground. Song for someone, all his best form has gone on tested ground. Uh, if there was one funny enough in here, I think could cause uh, Rock the Apple Cart a bit. It would be Gars Your Dreams, who's the, the Raffy, as our old friend Shane Anderson would like to say. But um, mm -hmm. he won at Cheltenham on his comeback last month for the form, and that's working out pretty well. Uh, art approvals come out once since uh, the runner up Cool Cody which was leading the Paddy Power Gold Cup turning into the home straight. Don't think that was a bad run, shall we say? Uh, so, yeah, I think Buzz is one they've all got to beat. And I, I would uh, I agree with Vincent. I'd be against Goshen on, on account of ground and just reliability more than anything. Uh, he's a lovely horse mm. when he's on song. And of course, we all, we all kind of still mem have the memories of him being 17 lengths clear in the Triumph Fertile mm. when it all went wrong. But, um, you know, what he's done since then has been very hot and cold. So, yeah, on balance, I think Buzz is definitely the horse they've got to beat. But I uh, wouldn't be shocked if Guard Your Dreams followed him home. 
Great stuff. Now let's move on to Haydock and another small field race, but it's the 150, the graduation chase. Now, Ed, I think we've spoken about Brave Man's game in the past as well, but how do you rate him? And um, yeah, should this one again be a fairly straightforward win for him? Uh, I put it this way. I, I spoke about this on, on last week's show. We were talking about um, the Willie Mullins mayor, uh, was it Echoes and Rain, saying I actually think she's a high class man. She could make up into champion hurdle candidate. But her price for that race, like in the Morgiana, was an absolute joke. Uh, she was priced up as if she was already Annie Power. And I think there's a, not quite to that extent here, but I mean, Brave Man's game is going to be a long odds on favourite here. And he's already priced up as if he's been to the top and done it. I mean, I'm, mm. facts are, according to the BHA, he's not even the best horse in the lineup, if you see what I'm saying. Um, itchy feet would be giving him weight in a handicap. He has to give him weight here due to the conditions of the race. But Itchy Feet actually still comes out the best horse at the weights. So I put it this way. I think Braves Man's game has got the potential, clearly, and it probably will be the best horse in the race. But he's priced up as if he has much more of a superiority over his rivals than perhaps I think we're led to believe. Itchy Feet is the joker in the pack here. He's got some good form in defeat. He, he just throws in that one leap, which will let him down. But by and large, you know, he's been placed in all rounds. He's got good graded chase form. He's a solid mid-150s horse. I think he will give Brave Man's game quite a lot to think about. So, not your question. I don't think he'll be straightforward. I think Brave Man's game will win. But I think he's got more on his plate than perhaps, as I said, the betting would lead you to believe. I don't. I think this is far from a formality. And how about for you, Vincent? Any potential upsets again in this one? Or is it fairly straightforward again for Brave Man's game? I think with the small field, it's probably fairly straightforward here. He gets weight from itchy feet. Um, it's a Nichols horse early season. They run up sequences. He'll, he'll be headed to Cheltenham in March, having won five or six of these. And all the UK people will be thinking they've got a chance <laughs> of beating the likes of Bob Oliver and they've not And that's, that's where we go. And, and the yeah. same happens year in, year out. He'll, he'll be a five or six to one chance in Cheltenham and you'll be scratching your head after and say, how was he beaten 25 runs by Bob Oliver? <laughs> <laughs> and that's what happens. Well, my, right, my, Drogo would be th my Drogo would be three lengths ahead of Bob Ollinger anyway, so I suppose it might matter. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe so. Let's wait and see. Yeah. A lot right, of water to go under the bridge before then. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's move on to a race that's maybe a little bit more hard to call, and that is the 2.25. Uh, so you've got the Stayers Handicap Hurdle here. Looks like the favourites between Riggs and Right Place Right Time, the two, yeah, two likely favourites, as I say. Ed, take us through this one. I mean, yeah, again, it's going to be a hard one to call, isn't it? Yeah, I'm not going to bore you with Waffle. I'm happily sitting this one out, uh, mainly because most years when I look at this race, uh, you've got to remember, again, ground conditions at Haydock are, are good to soft. It's been pretty dry there all week. There's a few showers coming in now, but this is not going to be your, your Haydock swamp that we used to. Mm -hmm. And so as a consequence, there's, there's often three or four runners in this race, which I circle when the five the entries come in as the, the genuine mudlarks who are going to get their conditions that their, their once a year kind of benefit race. And they're the ones to focus on here. Good ground has made this really far too trappy for me. So, um, yeah, I, I don't have an, a natural angle in here. I think it's too tricky to call. I can make a case for half the field. So I'm going to leave it out. And how about for you, Vincent, you share that same theory or have you got a bit of a different angle into the race? No, I, I've, I've no real fancy in it. I just see a couple of Irish horses in it who we know a bit about. Dr. Duffy of Charles Burns. Charles Burns will be having a good run of it when he brings them to the UK in the last few months. Um, he's landed a couple of nice touches in that blazing cow, which uh, Ed mentioned earlier, which was impressive last week, a real dour stare. Dr. Duffy has some sort of a chance. You can't rule out a Charles Burns one, but fairly exposed. We, we've seen him many times down the, the last few years, and I don't think there's anything... Um, hidden away from us in the locker there. The interesting one for me is probably the horse down the bottom, right place, right time. Another guy who has a serious record when he brings horses to the UK or anywhere for that matter is Emmett Mullins. And um, this horse has been chasing and he, he won a nice win last time in Ferry House. You, you wouldn't say he's a great horse, but at the same time, he could be sneaking in here off bottom weight. Um, he'll obviously have his chance and there'll be plenty of supporters for both of the Irish horses, I'd imagine, each way. All right, well, let's move on to the big race of the weekend, of course, the Betfair Chase at Haydock. Now, here we've got, yeah, three-time previous winner, Bristol Dumai in the running. Aplutard is going to be going off as the likely favourite. Um, but here, Vincent, I mean, how much are you looking forward to this year's renewal of the Betfair Chase? Well, um, a Plutard is the obvious one, isn't it? it, it um, how good is this horse? Probably a lot better than the opposition here, for starters. Um, Rachel Blackmore decides to ride, which is interesting in the sense that a lot of people were wondering about the fact would she ride Bob Ollinger instead um, over the weekend. But look, 
realistically, I think a, a blue tarp is the one waiting patiently. How long do you have to wait? Is the question. <laughs> that horse hasn't won in years. Like it's what is it? February 2018 is the last time that horse won a race. Bristol de May has won this three times. Fair enough. I don't think he's really met the class of a blue tarp. And I'd expect that's the winner for me. I'd hope so anyway. Um, after what we saw in the Gold Cup, you'd like to think that it's this horse and the other, the Brahman. The Bromhead horse, Manella Indo, really are class animals and you'd like to see them perform. I know Manella Indo didn't quite do it against Froden in Down Royal, but um, probably a trip slightly short of its best and needing the run. I'd like to think of Blue Tard is a little bit further forward here and we'll see a win. And for you, Ed, I mean, obviously Bristol De Mai, three-time winner, but do you think the conditions just won't suit him here? And of course, Abu Tard being a more superior horse. Yeah, I, I, look, I mean, it's fascinating. I think Abu Tard is the more superior horse, most likely winner. Um... So, yeah, essentially, the, the, the ground being as inverted commas as quick as it is, is definitely in our Plutard's ballpark here. I mean, if conditions turned heavy, it would naturally change the complexion of this race massively. And would if it just turned into a real test of stamina, that clearly plays to Bristol Demire's strengths. I mean, it's interesting to listen to Mr. Davis' team. They've said it, look, it's not that he doesn't go on good ground. I mean, he, he won this race a couple of years ago on, I think it was officially good, good to soft in places. But it's a more of a case of in heavy, a lot of other horses just don't like it, whereas he acts in it, if you see what I'm saying. And I do think he kind of nullifies the class edge of others. Aplutard's going to have lovely racing ground here. He's the class act. There was one worry. It would be he's been beaten on his seasonal reappearance pretty much every season he's raced. Uh, however, uh, I, on those occasions, he's very much reappeared with bigger targets in mind. For the life of me, Henry de Bromhead would not have this horse coming to the Betfair chase undercooked to Rachel Blackmore mm -hmm. on board, put it that way. Um, if they were that worried, they would have found a, a got a prep run into him, even a spin over hurdles or something. So, mm -hmm. look, Aplutard, I think, clearly is the one to beat. It's a muddling bunch of behind. I mean, you can never rule out Bristol to mind for crikey. I mean, the horse has won this three times. I just think on heavy ground, it would really play to his strengths. Uh, Chris Broipa guy, I think, wants bottomless ground. I know uh, Stephen Harris, uh, regular contributor on here, he, he waited patiently. He's been kind of flagging up the case for with the change of stables and the better ground. But, um, yeah, I mean, he's become the ultimate cliff horse of cliff horses, hasn't he, really? Um, so, yeah, if I was going to throw one in there at the bigger price, it's just for the trip. His Imperial Aura is totally unexposed over this distance for the fact he's never raced over it. Um, I mean, he was last seen getting absolutely blown away by Aloho in the Ryanair chase. I mean, that was run at a frenetic gallop over two and a half. He's bred to stay. Like a lot of the Kim Bailey horses, they, they all end up relentless gallopers, don't they? Uh, you know, go back to the days of Master Roats and, the, you know, Harry Topper more recently, those types. So I think his, his future definitely is overstaying trips. Whether first time out against this calibre opposition, um, it'll be good enough, I don't know. But um, I expect he's, he's not short of toe. You know, he has one over two and a half miles. I expect him to be trying, they'll try and switch him off at the back and kind of let everything kind of burn up at the head of affairs, if you see what I'm saying. And he'll come through with a, he'll be ridden, a bit like waiting patiently, I imagine, and kind of uh, come through in, in the closing stages. But I think it's that Plutarch to lose. And again, I've not had a bet in the race, but if you're forcing me, I'll go in pure Laura for the, uh, the kind of each way forecast angle. But it, it's a fascinating renewal, uh, but not one I'm having a bet in. Absolutely. Of course, we will review the race uh, this time next week as well. But moving on now, we're going to go over to Navin on Sunday. And a couple of races we're on a feature here. So starting off with the Troy Town Handicap. So Vincent, take us through this one. I mean, what do you think conditions are going to be like at Navin? And who is it going to suit best in this big field? Well, currently they're talking about goodish ground for Navin and very little rain. I think they're only due three millimetres between now and Sunday. And um, obviously we haven't got a final field here. Um, it's hard to it's hard to know what exactly will run first off, but the the one thing to note here realistically is county mead trainers tend to do very well in this race because obviously it's their local big race at Navan and they target it each year. Eight of the last fourteen winners were trained by trainers in county mead, and of course that includes Gordon Elliott who had I think he said four winners, three winners of this in a row. I think at one stage recently, um, but one I liked at a big price is Noel Mead's. Um, He's got, uh, which is, I find the horse now for me, Snow Falcon. Uh, Snow Falcon, he won a Kerry National a couple of years ago. He was fancied in the Kerry National again at big prices back in September and ran okay. Um, wasn't beaten very far. He was only beaten eight lengths, stayed on from the rear, never really in contention. He's not really a three-miler as such. He's probably best over slightly shorter. But the, the interesting fact here is not only is he a local trained horse by Noel Mead, and the horses in the stable are running well. But the other thing around this is the fact that um, this horse is a fantastic record in Navan. 
I think he's six runs there, three wins, three places, but he's never run there over fences. So it'd be interesting to see him over fences on better ground. Um, but realistically, Navin, stick with the local trainers. And there's a few who have entries in it. You've not only got Noel Mead, you've got Gordon, you've got Gavin Cromwell, Tom Gidney. I think they're the main ones that are in it this year. It's also the 100th anniversary of Navin Racecourse. So um, that'll be a big day for them. They're celebrating it that particular day on Sunday um, with their big race. So it should be a good day. The one thing is, if you're going to Navin, wrap up warm, coldest place on this planet. And um, I think if you're Antarctic explorers, they send them there for a day out just to acclimatize before they go down. So it really is, this is some bitter place in the middle of winter. I can't believe it. I think recently, I don't know why I'm harping on about this. I'm out in Spain. Stay in Spain. Go. Stay in Spain. <laughs> yeah, yeah, stay in Spain. I'm not going back to Navin yet. But um, uh, I had a thing on Twitter there a while ago where it was, uh, someone had written that the curl was the coldest um, race course in Ireland. Tell you something, Navin takes some beating in those winter days. They have those big braziers out. I don't know whether they happen at many English tracks, but the, the big braziers out, you want to be within about three feet of one of them to survive. It, it really is a bitter place in, in the depths of winter. It probably won't be that bad this time. The weather's been a little bit um, more benign this season so far this winter, but um, it'd be a good day's race. And, and then the sorry, they're just going to cut on to the bumper here because it's the other race we were going to mention on that card. It's just it's an interesting winner's bumper for mares. Um, there's a few decent types in that, and that's that's a race certain to look out for. There were some good winners of it in recent years. We've had Augusta, Augusta Kate, Barrington Court, Big Bad and Beautiful, and there's a few nice types in it. Uh, the Model Kingdom in Preston Galway the last time. You've got a horse called Happy Dex, which was an expensive point-to-point -point winner, um, and there's also a horse of Emmett Mullins, Agri Time. So it looks like that could be a fair little contest to round off the, the Sunday afternoon in Nava. Lovely stuff. Well, thanks a lot for that preview, guys. And now we're going to move on to our top tips of the week. We're going to kick off with a quick review of how the guys have done in previous weeks. So, Ed, I think I'm going to kick off with you because you were the big winner from last week. Of course, Sporting John was a 14 to 1 winner if you backed it at the time of recording. So take us through your tips from last week and uh, yeah, how they did. Yeah, they all ran pretty well, um, which was, was nice to see. Uh, Bundoran, uh, the old boy, finished third. So if you did back him each way, you'd have collected your money there in the two-mile handicap chase. That was a good performance. Yes, yeah, Sporting John. So we said, Kai Klaas, novice herder, lost his way over fences, back over hurdles. He jumped and travelled supremely well, and uh, he flew up that Cheltenham Hill. So, uh, yeah, as I said, I think they'll think of the stayers hurdle in mind. Oscar Elite's the one that got away. Uh, if he jumped three out, mm. he, he basically, I'm convinced he would have won. I know it's a game of ifs and buts. The fence is there to be jumped, but he, he looked like an absolute natural chaser on debut. Um, so there's another day for him. And then Tritonic, again, um, some firms, you would have got your each way play for fifth. He kind of got going far too late, but did come up the Chatham Hill well into fifth place in the Great Wood out of 20 runners or whatever. So, yeah, they're all kind of either hitting the crossbar or, or one, which it was it was a good week in it, yeah, amongst some absolutely yeah, thoroughly exciting uh, entertainment at Chatham. So let's move on to your tips for this week then, Ed. Uh, what have you got in store for us? Yeah, a tricky one. As I said, Haydock normally I like to get stuck into, but a good ground's kind of thrown me a curveball there. And I think it's thrown, confused a few connections as well, funny enough. So I'm sticking with Ascot uh, on the Friday. Uh, Captain Morgs for Nicky Henderson and Nico de Boinville. Uh, I was at Channel for the October meeting. I had this horse and seasonal reappearance on Handicap debut. He tanked round uh, coming into the home straight and then just looked a bit tired and... To my mind, I put it as a question mark fitness slash non stare Well, it is interesting that coming back from two and a half to two miles, which makes perfect sense to me, given that when he ran over course of distance last year, he won. So I think the, come, the drop back from two and a half to two miles, coming back to Ascot with that run under his belt, all big positives for Captain Borg. So I think he'll take a lot of beating on the Friday. And then we go for one of double figure prices on the Saturday. Uh, Diego de Charmille uh, for Paul Nichols. He's a horse who courses. It's got some very good form at Ascot. I mean, he's fallen once. Outside of that, his form figures over C and D over fences read three one two. Of course, the one coming in that absolute carnage race with Capeland a couple of years ago when horses were running through wings and outside fences and all sorts. But look, <laughs> nonetheless, he's got some very good form at Ascot. He slipped to a, a BHA mark of one fifty which is the same rating as when he last won off. And he had a spin over hurdles at Foss last recently. And Paul Nichols said in his preseason stable tour, uh, he's basically, this is his target. He'll be trained to a minute for this. I, I love Paul Nichols at, well, at the best of times, but especially for these kind of early season targets. You know, he's he's worked out 
there's there's more than just your five or six horses in the yard that you know the ones that go in at the charter festival you've got to work on what you do with the other hundred as well and uh he you know he plots these horses up brilliantly this looks like it is the target for him he's a double figure price Lorcan williams is on board claiming another three pounds off as well i, I generally I, I did the tissue for this when the entries came through i had him around a six to one shot so at 12 to one i've definitely got to back diego ducharme or ask on saturday well, a great value pick for you there, Ed. And once again, after that big value tip from last week, hopefully more of the same this week. Now, moving on to Vincent and your top predictions for the weekend ahead. Yeah, well, basically, I've only two now, realistically, um, which is, I've mentioned both of them already. One of them is Buzz, which I think shade of odds on now with, with only the four runners in it, or I think it's four or five runners in that race. Mm. Um, but I, my basic strategy here is take on Goshen, and I think Buzz is a solid horse to take on Goshen with. So I think Shade of Odds on, I'd be happy enough to go with that. And then the other horse I have is Snow Falcon. It's just a tentative one because it's a big race in Ireland this weekend. The Labrooks Troytown Handicap Chase. Um, Snow Falcon's around, what, 25 to 1, I think. Yeah, you have that there for Paddy Power. 25 to 1 shot. Not sure of the final field at this stage, but if it does run, has a chance little question mark over the trip but on better ground maybe it'll just about get home and if it's ridden properly i can see it run well loves the track so be an interesting weekend's racing realistically because there's some very good races around and some good horses run in ireland and the uk mainly irish ones i have to say well best of luck to both of you for your tips so thanks a lot for your efforts guys and once again now that wraps up for today's show of jump to it of course if you want to get in touch with us as well you can head on over to the youtube channel and drop comments below the video let us know your predictions for the weekend's racing and if you are going to be placing a bet as always we do ask that you gamble responsibly